James didn't want, by the way, chapter 25, the earthworm and the centipede to get into another argument. So he said quickly to the earthworm, tell me, what do you play and or do you play any kind of music? No, but I do other things, some of which are really quite extraordinary, the earthworm said, brightening. Such as what? asked James. Well, the earthworm said, next time you stand in a field or in a garden, look around you. Then just remember this, that every grain of soil upon the surface of the land, every tiny little bit of soil that you can see has actually passed through the body of an earthworm during the last few years. Isn't that wonderful? Oh, it's not possible, said James. My dear boy, it's a fact. You mean you actually swallow soil? Like mad, the earthworm said proudly, in one end and out the other. But what's the point? Well, what do you mean, what's the point? Well, why do you do it? We do it for the farmers. It makes the soil nice and light and crumbly so that things will grow well in it. If you really want to know, the farmers couldn't do without us. We are essential. We are vital. Ooh, you guys, check out those two words, essential and vital. Ooh. So it is only natural that the farmers should love us. He loves us even more, I believe, than he loves the ladybug. The ladybug, said James, turning to look at her. Do they love you too? I am told they do, the ladybug answered, modestly blushing all over. In fact, I understand that in some places, the farmers love us so much that they go out and buy live ladybugs by the sackful and take them home and set them free in their fields. They are very pleased when they have lots of ladybugs in their fields. Okay, James asked the question I was asking in my head. But why, James asked, because we gobble up all the nasty little insects that are gobbling up all the farmer's crops. It helps enormously, and we ourselves don't charge a penny for our services. Oh, I think you're wonderful, James told her. Can I ask you one special question? Please do. Well, it's really true that I, is it really true that I can tell how old a ladybug is by counting her spots? Oh, no, that's just a children's story, the ladybug said. We never change our spots. Some of us, of course, are born with more spots than others, but we never change them. The number of spots that a ladybug has is simply a way of showing which branch of the family she belongs to. I, for example, as you can see for yourself, am a nine-spotted ladybug. I am very lucky. It is a fine thing to be. Oh, it is indeed, said James, gazing at the beautiful scarlet shell with nine black spots on it. On the other hand, the ladybug went on, some of my less fortunate relatives have no more than two spots altogether on their shells. Can you imagine that? They are called two-spotted ladybugs and very common in, and ill-mannered they are. Have you guys seen a two-spotted ladybug? Hmm. I regret to say, and then, of course, you have the five-spotted ladybugs as well. They are much nicer than the two-spotted ones, although I myself find them a trifle too saucy for my taste. <laughs> but they are all of them, are all of them loved, said James? Yes, the ladybug answered quietly. They are all of them loved. Well, it seems that almost everyone around here is loved, said James. How nice this is. Not me, cried the centipede happily. I'm a pest and I'm proud of it. Oh, I'm such a shocking, dreadful pest. Hear, hear, the earthworm said. But what about you, Miss Spider? asked James. Aren't you almost much loved in the world? Or also? Alas, no, Miss Spider answered, sighing long and loud. I am not loved at all, and yet I do nothing but good. All day long I catch flies and mosquitoes in my webs. I'm a decent person. Oh, I know you are, said James. It is very unfair the way we spiders are treated, Miss Spider went on. Why, only last week your own horrible Aunt Sponge flushed my poor dear father down the plug hole in the bathtub. <gasps> How awful, cried James. I washed the whole thing from a corner up in the ceiling, Miss Spider murmured. It was ghastly. We never saw him again. A large tear rolled down her cheek and fell with a splash on the floor. But it is not very unlikely to kill a spider, James inquired, looking around at the others. Of course, oh, he said unlucky. Sorry, you guys. Of course it's unlucky to kill a spider, shouted the centipede. It's about the unluckiest thing anyone can do. Look what happened to Aunt Sponge after she'd done that bump. We all felt it, didn't we? As the peach went over her. Oh, what a lovely bump that must have been for you, Miss Spider. It was very satisfactory, Miss Spider answered. Will you sing a song about it, please? So the centipede did. 
Aunt Sponge was terribly fat and tremendously flabby at that. Her tummy and waist were as soggy as paste. It was worse on the place where she sat. So she said, I must make myself flat. I must make myself sleek as a cat. I shall do without dinner to make myself thinner. But along came the peach. Oh, the beautiful peach. And made her far thinner than that. Oh, that was very nice, Miss Spider said. Now sing one about Aunt Spiker. Oh, with pleasure, the centipede answered, grinning. And Spiker was thin as a wire, and as dry as a bone, only drier. She was so long and thin, if you carried her in, you could use her for poking the fire. I must do something quickly, she's frowned. I want fat, I want pound upon pound. I must eat lots and lots of marshmallows and chalks till I start budging out all around. Ah, yes, she announced, I have sworn that I'll alter my figure by dawn. Cried the peach with a snigger, I'll alter your figure and ironed her out on the lawn. Everyone clapped and called out for more songs from the centipede, who at once launched into his favorite song of all. Once upon a time when pigs were swine and monkeys chewed tobacco, and hens took snuff to make themselves tough, and the ducks said quack, 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 oh, and porcupines drank fiery wines and goats ate tobacco tapioca the old mother hubbard got stuck in the look out centipede cried look out chapter 26 the centipede who had begun dancing wildly around the deck during the song had suddenly gone too close to the downward curving edge of the peach and for three awful seconds he had stood teetering on the brink swinging his legs frantically in circles in an effort to stop himself from falling over backward into space but before anyone could reach him down he went he gave a shriek of terror as he fell, and the others, rushing to the side and peering over, saw his poor long body tumbling over and over through the air, getting smaller and smaller until it was out of sight. Okay, what do you predict is going to happen? Silkworm, yelled James. Quick, start spinning. The silkworm sighed, for she was still very tired from spinning all that silk for the seagulls, but she did as she was told. I'm going down after him, cried James, grabbing the silk string as it started coming out of the silkworm and tying the end of it around his waist. The rest of you hold on to silkworm so I don't pull her over with me, and later on, if you feel three tugs on the string, start hauling me up again. He jumped, and he went tumbling down after the centipede, down, 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 down toward the sea below, and you can imagine how quickly the silkworm had to spin to keep up with the fall, the speed of his fall. We'll never see either of them again, cried the ladybug. Oh, dear, oh, dear, just when we were all so happy, too. Miss Spider, the glowworm, and the ladybug all began to cry. So did the earthworm. I don't care a bit about the centipede, the earthworm sobbed, but I really did love that little boy. Very softly, the old green grasshopper started to play the funeral march on his violin. Dun, 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 dun. And by the time he had finished, everyone, including himself, was in a flood of tears. Suddenly, there came three sharp tugs on the rope. Pull! shouted the old green grasshopper. Everyone, get behind me and pull! There was about a mile of string to be hauled in, but they all worked like mad. And in the end, over the side of the peach, there appeared a dripping wet James with a dripping wet centipede, clinging to him tightly with all 42 of his legs. He saved me, gasped the centipede. He swam around in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean until he found me. Oh, my dear old boy, the old green grasshopper said, patting James on the back. I do congratulate you. My boots, cried the centipede. Just look at my precious boots. They are ruined by the water. Oh, be quiet, the earthworm said. You are lucky to be alive. Are we still going up and up? asked James. We certainly are, answered the old green grasshopper, and it's beginning to get dark. Well, I know it'll be soon night. Well, why don't we go down below and keep warm until morning? Miss Spider suggested. No, the old green grasshopper said. I think that would be very unwise. It will be safer if we all stay up here through the night and keep watch. Then if anything happens, we shall anyway be ready for it. Chapter 27 James Henry Trotter and his companions crouched close together on top of the peach as the night began closing in around them. Clouds like mountains towered high above their heads on all sides, mysterious, menacing, overwhelming. Okay, you guys, is there a context clue in there to help you with the word menacing? I kind of am leaning towards kind of overwhelming. Gradually, it grew darker and darker, then a pale three-quarter moon came up over the tops of the clouds, 
and cast an eerie light over the whole scene. The giant peach swayed gently from side to side as it floated along, and the hundreds of silky white strings going upward from its stem were beautiful in the moonlight. So also was the great flock of seagulls overhead. There was not a sound anywhere. Traveling upon the peach was not in the least like traveling in an airplane. The airplane comes clattering and roaring through the sky, and whatever might be lurking secretly up there in the great cloud mountains goes running for cover as it approaches. That is why people who travel in airplanes never see anything. But the peach, ah, yes, the peach was a soft, stealthy traveler, making no noise at all as it floated along. Now, context clue for stealthy. No noise. And several times during that long, silent night ride high up over the middle of the ocean, in the moonlight, James and his friends saw things that no one had ever seen before. Once, as they drifted silently past a massive white cloud, they saw on top of it a group of strange, tall, whiskey-looking things that were about twice the height of ordinary men. They were not easy to see at first because they were almost as white as the cloud itself, but as the peach sailed closer, it became quite obvious that these things were actually living creatures, tall, wispy, wraith-like, shadowy white creatures who looked as though they were made out of a mixture of cotton wool and candy floss and thin white hairs. Ooh, the ladybug said, I don't like this at all. Shh, James whispered back. Don't let them hear you. They must be cloud men. Cloud men, they murmured, huddling closer together for comfort. Oh dear, oh dear. I'm glad I'm blind. I can't see them, the earthworm said, or I would probably scream. I hope they don't turn around and see us, Miss Spider stammered. Do you think they would eat us? The earthworm asked. Well, they would eat you, the centipede answered, grinning. They would cut you up like a salami and eat you in thin slices. The poor earthworm began to quiver all over with fright. But what are they doing? The old green grasshopper whispered. Oh, I don't know, James answered softly. Let's watch and see. The cloud men were all standing in a group, and they were doing something peculiar with their hands. First, they would reach out, all of them at once, and grab handfuls of clouds. Then they would roll these handfuls of clouds in their fingers until they turned into what looked like large white marbles. Then they would toss the marbles to one side and quickly grab more bits of cloud and start over again. It was all very silent and mysterious. The pile of marbles beside them kept growing larger and larger, and soon there was a truckload of them there at least. They must be absolutely mad, the centipede said. There's nothing to be afraid of here. Be quiet, you pest, the earthworm whispered. We shall all be eaten if they see us. But the cloud men were much too busy with what they were doing to have noticed the great peach floating silently up behind them. Then the watchers on the peach saw one of the cloud men raising his long, wispy arms above his head, and they heard him shouting, All right, boys, that's enough. Get the shovels. And all the other cloud men immediately let out a strange, high-pitched whoop of joy and started jumping up and down and waving their arms in the air. Then they picked up enormous shovels and rushed over to the pile of marbles and began shoveling them as fast as they could over the side of the cloud into space. Down they go, they chanted as they worked. Okay, what are they doing, you guys? Down they go, hail and snow, freezes and sneezes and noses will blow. <gasps> it's hailstones, whispered James excitedly. They've been making hailstones and now they are showering them down onto the people in the world below. Hailstones? The centipede said, that's ridiculous. This is summertime. You don't have hailstones in summertime. They're practicing for the winter, James told them. Oh, I don't believe it, shouted the centipede, raising his voice. Shh, the others whispered. And James said softly, for heaven's sake, centipede, don't make so much noise. The centipede roared with laughter. Those imbeciles couldn't hear anything, he cried. They're deaf as doorknobs, you watch. And before anyone could stop him, he had cupped his front feet to his mouth and was yelling at the cloud men as loud as he could. Hey, idiots, he yelled. Nincompoops, halfwits, blunderheads. What on earth do you think you're doing over there? Okay, all the synonyms for each other. The effect was immediate. The cloud men jumped around as if they had been stung by wasps. And when they saw the great golden peach floating past them, not 50 yards away in the sky, they gave a yelp of surprise 
and dropped their shovels to the ground. And there they stood with the moonlight streaming down all over them, absolutely motionless, like a group of tall, white, hairy statues, staring and staring at the gigantic fruit as it went by. The passengers on the peach, well, all except the centipede, sat frozen with terror, looking back at the cloud men and wondering what was going to happen next. Now you've done it, you loathsome pest, whispered the earthworm to the centipede. I'm not afraid of them, shouted the centipede, and to show everybody once again that he wasn't, he stood up to his full height and started dancing about and making insulting signs at the cloud men with all 42 of his legs. This evidently infuriated the cloud men beyond belief. All at once, they spun around and grabbed great handfuls of hailstones and rushed to the edge of the cloud and started throwing them at the peach, shrieking with fury all the time. Look out, cried James. Quick, lie down. Lie flat on the deck. It was lucky they did. A large hailstone can hurt you as much as a rock or a lump of lead if it is thrown hard enough. And my goodness, how those cloud men could throw. The hailstones came whizzing through the air like bullets from a machine gun, and James could hear them smashing against the side of the peach and burying themselves in the peach flesh with horrible squelching noises. Pop, plop, plop, and then ping, 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 as they bounced off the poor ladybug's shell because she couldn't lie as flat as the others. And then crack, as one of them hit the centipede right on the nose, and crack, as another one hit him somewhere else. Ow, he cried. Ow, stop! But the cloud men had no intention of stopping. James could see them rushing about on the cloud like a lot of huge hairy ghosts, picking up hailstones from the pile, dashing to the edge of the cloud, hurling the hailstones at the peach, dashing back again to get more. And then when the pile of stones was all gone, they simply grabbed handfuls of cloud and made as many more as they wanted and much bigger ones. Now, some of them large as cannonballs. Is the peach going to be OK, you guys? Quickly! cried James, down the tunnel or we'll all be wiped out. There was a rush for the tunnel entrance, and half a minute later, everybody was safely downstairs inside the stone of the peach. Trembling with fright and listening to the noise of the hailstones as they came crashing against the side of the peach, I'm a wreck, groaned the centipede. I'm wounded all over. It serves you right, said the earthworm. Would somebody kindly look and see if my shell is cracked? The ladybug said, give us some light shouted the old green grasshopper. I can't, wailed the glowworm. They've broken my bulb. Then put in another one, the centipede said. Be quiet a moment, said James. Listen, I do believe they're not hitting us anymore. They all stopped talking and listened. Yes, the noise had ceased. The hailstones were no longer smashing against the peach. So what would be a context clue for ceased, you guys? What does that mean? We've left them behind. The seagulls must have pulled us out of danger. Hooray, let's go up and see. Cautiously, with James going first, they all climbed back up the tunnel. James poked his head out and looked around. It's all clear, he called. I can't see them anymore. Chapter 28 One by one, the travelers came out again onto the top of the peach and gazed carefully around. The moon was still shining as brightly as ever, and there were still plenty of huge, shimmering cloud mountains on all sides but no cloud men in sight. The peach is leaking, shouted the old green grasshopper peering over the side. It's full of holes and the juice is dripping out everywhere. That does it, cried the earthworm. If the peach is leaking, then we shall surely sink. Oh, don't be ridiculous, the centipede told him. We're not in the water now. Oh, look, shouted the ladybug. Look, look over there. Everybody swung around to look. In the distance and directly ahead of them, they now saw a most extraordinary sight. It was a kind of arch a colossal, curvy-shaped thing that reached high up into the sky and came down again at both ends. Okay, what would be an antonym for colossal, you guys? The ends were resting upon a huge flat cloud that was as big as a desert. Now, what in the world is that? asked James. It's a bridge. It's an enormous hoop cut in half. It's a giant horseshoe standing upside down. Well, stop me if I'm wrong, murmured the centipede, white in the face, but those might be not be cloud men climbing all over it. There was a dreadful silence. The peach floated closer and closer. They are cloud men. There are hundreds of them, thousands, millions. I don't want to hear about it, shrieked the poor blind earthworm. I'd rather be on the end of a fish hook and use as bait than come up against those terrible creatures again. Well, I'd rather be fried alive and eaten by Mexican wheel the old green grasshopper. Please be quiet whispered James. It's our only hope. They crouched very still on top of the peach, staring at the cloud men. The whole surface of the cloud was literally swarming with them, 
and there were hundreds more up above, climbing about on the monstrous crazy arch. But what is that thing? whispered the ladybug, and what are they doing to it? Well, I don't care what they're doing to it, the centipede said, scuttling over to the tunnel entrance. I'm not staying up here. Goodbye. But the rest of them were too frightened or too hypnotized by the whole affair to make a move. Do you do you know what? What? They said, what? That enormous arch, they seem to be painting it. Ooh, what could it be? They've got pots of paint and big brushes. You look. And he was quite right. The travelers were close enough to see that this was exactly what the clown men were doing. They all had huge brushes in their hands and they were splashing the paint onto the great curvy arch in a frenzy of speed. So fast, in fact, that in the few minutes, the whole of the arch became covered with the most glorious colors. Reds, blues, greens, yellows, and purples. <gasps> it's a rainbow! Were you right? Everyone said at once, they're making a rainbow. Oh, isn't it beautiful? Just look at those colors. Centipede, you must come up and see this. They were so enthralled by the beauty and brilliance of the ramble that they forgot to keep their voices lower any longer. The centipede poked his head cautiously out of the tunnel. Well, 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 I've always wondered how those things were made, but why all the ropes? What are they doing with those ropes? Good heavens, they're pushing it off the cloud. There it goes. They're lowering it down to the earth with ropes. And I'll tell you something, the centipede said sharply. If I'm not greatly mistaken, we ourselves are going to bump right into it. <gasps> Bless my soul, he's right, the old green grasshopper exclaimed. The rainbow was now dangling in the air below the cloud. The peach was also just below the level of the cloud and was heading directly toward the rainbow, traveling rather fast. We're lost, Miss Spider cried, wringing her feet. The end has come. I can't stand it, wailed the earthworm. Tell me what's going to happen. We're going to miss it shouted the ladybug. No, we're not. Yes, we are. Yes, yes. No. Oh, my heavens. Hold on, everybody. James called out, and suddenly there was a tremendous thud as the peach went crashing into the top part of the rainbow. This was followed by an awful splintering noise as the enormous rainbow snapped right across the middle and became two separate pieces. The next thing that happened was extremely unfortunate. The ropes that the cloudman had been using for lowering the rainbow got tangled up with the silk strings that went up from the peach to the seagulls. The peach was trapped. Panic and pandemonium broke out among the travelers, and James Henry Trotter glanced up quickly, saw the faces of a thousand furious cloudmen peering down at him over the edge of the cloud. The faces had almost no shape at all because of the long white hairs that covered them. There were no noses, no mouths, no ears, no chins. Only the eyes were visible in each face. Two small black eyes glinting malevolently through the hairs. Then came the most frightening thing of all. One cloudman, a huge hairy creature who must have been 14 feet tall at least, suddenly stood up and made a tremendous leap off the side of the cloud, trying to get to one of the silk strings above the peach. James and his friends saw him go flying through the air above them, his arms outstretched in front of him, reaching for the nearest string, and they saw him grab it and cling to it with his hands and legs. And then very, very slowly, hand over hand, he began climbing down the string. Mercy, help save us, cried the ladybug. He's coming down to eat us, wailed the old green grasshopper. Jump overboard, then eat the earthworm first, shouted the centipede. It's no good eating me, I'm full of bones like a kipper. Centipede, yelled James, quickly bite through the string and the one he's coming down on. The centipede rushed over to the stem of the peach, took the silk string in his teeth and bit through it with one snap of his jaws. Immediately, far above them, a single seagull was seen to come away from the rest of the flock and go flying off with a long string trailing from its neck. And clinging desperately to the end of the string, shouting and cursing with fury, was the huge hairy cloudman. Up and up he went, swinging across the moonlit sky, and James Henry Trotter watched him with delight. My goodness, he must weigh almost nothing at all for one seagull to be able to pull him up like that. He must be all hair and air. The rest of the cloudmen were so flabbergasted at seeing one of their company carried away in this manner that they let go of the ropes they were holding. And then, of course, down went the rainbow, both halves of it together, tumbling toward the earth below. This freed the peach, which at once began sailing away from that terrible cloud. But the travelers were not in the clear yet. The infuriated cloudmen jumped up and down and ran after them along the cloud, pelting them mercilessly with all sorts of hard and horrible objects. Empty paint buckets, paintbrushes, dead rats, bottles of hair oil, anything those brutes could lay their hands on came raining down upon the beach. 
One cloud man, taking very careful aim, tipped a gallon of thick purple paint over the edge of the cloud right onto the centipede himself. The centipede screamed with anger. My legs, he cried. They're all sticking together. I can't walk and my eyelids won't open. I can't see. My boots, my boots are ruined. But for the moment, everyone was far too busy dodging the things that the cloud men were throwing to pay any attention to the centipede. The paint is drying, he moaned. It's going hard. I can't move my legs. I can't move anything. Uh, you can still move your mouth, the earthworm said, and that's a great pity. James, bawled the centipede. Please help me wash off this paint. Scrape it off anything.